being here. I have um, 40 minutes. I hope to have some time for questions for you guys as well. Um, I'll try and talk in, say, 30, 35 minutes. I'll give you an overview of free and open source software in public administrations in Europe. I've been writing for a project at the European Commission for 10 years, so the main thing I'll try and do here is give you uh, a set of tips, a set of things that public administrations need to do, a, a, a set of things that we can check whether public administrations have them in place that will make them slowly switch to open source. A few disclaimers. Uh, I am an external contractor. I'm just a journalist. I happen to be in the lucky position to work for the European Commission. I am not the European Commission. So the things I say here are my view, not the Commission's view. And when I talk about free software, I mean open source. And when I say open source, I mean free software. For me, as a person, it's more or less synonymous. So when you see it behind me on the screen, go either way. This talk has um, six chapters. Um, I'll give you, as I announced, the, uh, the yes. Can you enlarge the screen, please? It's, um, I struggle to read it. We'll need a bigger beamer. <laughs> this is as big as it gets. Sorry, you can. Right. Control and plus button. The control and the plus button. Oh. Is that better? One yeah. more. 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 Once more. As long as I don't use my, lose my notes. Again. Better? Again. <laughs> Can we have your votes? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll, again. So I'll give you the, the, the main things that I see um, that are requirements for public administrations. Um, I will quickly, this is the desktop development room, I'll quickly run through um, the main desktop implementations that we have in Europe. I will give you the key policies. Um, I will sh talk briefly about what are the expected benefits when public administrations go to open source. Uh, one of the things that worries me is the point that's called what's missing, because there's a few things missing. Um, but I first need to talk about the uh, OZO project. But So, just to Bear with me for five seconds. I'll show you how it works. Um, this is the how-to. <coughs> These are the main implementations, the key policies, the expected benefits, and what's missing. Some of these slides go deep. Um, so that's what happens here. So first, the open source observatory. Um, we have more than 2,000 news items. We have case studies. We have best practices. We have how-tos. Um, the, the project tries to cover any public administration that uses open source, that implements open source, is thinking about doing this or is considering to stop doing it. We bring a lot of positive news because the trend is public administrations are going to open source, but every now and then it goes wrong, so we report about that as well. It's the open source observatory and repository. So we have a catalog of solutions made for and by public administrations. There are some 4,000 of them. That's also be, it's not all done at the commission level, but we link repositories in the member states. There's a whole bunch of them, like 12 in Spain. There's a bunch in, there's one or two in Austria. We have one in the Netherlands. There's one in Belgium. When you search for solutions on the OZOR, you will find the solutions in the Austrian and the Spanish repositories and vice versa. And the collection of these tools, a lot of this is for uh, electronic identification or for electronic procurement, anything to do with e-government. Those solutions are being built increasingly as open source. It's, you will hardly come across a public administration that these days is no longer developing tools as proprietary. That hardly ever happens. Something that we're very proud of or happy that we have done it is develop the EUPL. It's sort of a fork of the GPL. Uh, why was that necessary? The Commission has a principle that all of the software that the Commission now publishes is done as open source. A whole bunch of lawyers looked at the GPL and sort of feared that if the EC would do this and there was some kind of problem somewhere down the line, they would have to fly to the US to argue in a US court something about European-made software that they didn't want to do. 
so that's one big reason that they used the GPL and changed a bunch of things so that they could say, you go to a court in one of the member states, and if that doesn't work, you can go to a court in Brussels, in Belgium. Uh, so that was one reason. Another thing that is, I think, personally really cool is that they did this uh, license in all the languages of the European Union. That's 23, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that means that you can use, as a German developer, the German EUPL, and it's legally the same as the Dutch or the French or the Maltese or the Greek. So that makes working together as public administrations a lot simpler. So, some. Um, a little bit of context, the, uh, the OZOR is part of the, uh, is one of the small programs of the ISA Square program. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't want to bother you with the details, but the commission has a bunch of ministries. One of them is the Ministry for IT, it's called DGIT, Digit. They have a program that looks at the member states. DGIT is concerned with rolling out uh, software for the workstations and the services in the commission itself. But the ISA program is, more or less the only program that looks at all the member states and tries to get them together to work on solutions to share and reuse. And in this sharing and reuse program, they figured we need open source is a very easy way to get that done. And that's where OZOR comes in. It's a support tool for that uh, goal. As I promised, I will, uh, this is, for me, it's the main part of the presentation, how to fix open source so that how to fix uh, public administration so that they do uh, uh, open source. So the first thing we need to do is to make uh, free and open source software a task for the head of IT, for the head of the department, for the head of the IT department or the CIO at the ministry level or the municipality level or for the decision maker at the national level. Uh, I've listed three of the main <coughs> advantages that if a CEO these days does not have an open source strategy you would be you should be able to tell him that he has a sort of he doesn't know what he's doing because you really need to have an answer to open source as a decision maker in IT these days um, the license costs I will maybe touch on this later I just that's just the tip of the iceberg you're looking at scalability you're looking at flexibility you're looking at uh, the philosophy of innovation in your organization. That's what open source is doing. That's what public administrations across the EU are discovering. There's like tons of examples of this. And so it's good for a CEO, for a decision maker, to have a policy in place to say, we're currently not using it a lot. We're using it in the servers. We're using it uh, in our data warehouses, but we should be using it across the stack. So this is where we are, and this is where we need to go. Like the EC, they have a policy like that. They say, at, the, at, say, the back office, a lot of open source. At the workstations, some open source. The target is we should move to more open source across the stack. That's the policy. And then they can start disrupting parts of the infrastructure, say, that's too much proprietary. We need to you know, roll out uh, a switch program. One of the main... Uh, strategic goals for a CEO. The last one is, a, is basically a quote from uh, Liam Maxwell uh, a few years ago, the CEO for the UK government. It's taking control and get rid um, of lock-in. It's the main thing. Well, as I said, there's tons of examples. Uh, I've arranged them here at uh, levels of uh, government. So you have the national government, the United Kingdom's uh, the digital services. Um, they have an open source lead. She is looking at, currently she announced recently, she's looking at all the big applications out there which are already developed under an open source license, which is not the same as saying you do them as open source because that would require support and a roadmap and a community and engagement with this community. So she's trying to fix that part of the strategy. In France, you have a CIO, uh, who heads uh, a big government modernization unit, uh, Danzig. They have a very good, very solid, very well thought through uh, policy on openness, which includes a lot of open source, of course. Um, at the 
multi-municipality. There's a lot of municipalities across Europe that realize that they're doing the same as their neighbor, and they could be using the same tools as their neighbor, and they're starting to work together. I've listed a few examples. In Denmark, you have OS2. I think that has now 60% of all municipalities. That, and they are pooling their budgets, and it's making it a lot cheaper, and they're using a lot of Drupal-based, web-based uh, solutions, and they're rolling out fast, um, and they will pretty soon have maybe all of the municipalities, and their model is challenging the traditional model of the proprietary vendors and the proprietary central, it's not proprietary, the centralized government department. Because here, all of a sudden, you see municipalities working together, solving IT issues, which actually solve public administration issues, and it goes much faster than the central government department that tries to bring this top down can do. Uh, Norway, we have the Kongsberg region near Oslo, where they are doing a lot of web based services that increasingly other municipalities can use. So it's help desk, it's training, it's <coughs> calendaring, uh, and other uh, solutions that they host in their cloud. And other municipalities can say, oh, we have that as well. We need that as well. Here's a bit of our IT budget, because we would like that feature to be implemented. And the group as a whole starts fixing that. Belgium, great example, EMEO. It has about 200 municipalities in the French-speaking part of Belgium. They're all working together on uh, Python and Zopi-based uh, based, uh, solutions. That's like really great. It's huge, to quote uh, somebody. Uh, at the municipality itself, of course, um, Munich. I will not have to talk long about Munich here. It's world famous. Uh, a region. There's loads of regions. In France, there's several regions that do a lot on open source. I just pointed out here the Basque region. By the way, the slides are already online, and all these blue words are links to directly to the Ozor that will show you the article where this is based on. The Basque region has a free software policy. They want to do free software everywhere in the whole stack for everything. Uh, a bunch of years ago, the country, uh, the autonomous region, realized it was going to run out of money, and it gave their, it, it gave their staff the choice. Either we do something about our IT because it's really expensive, or we start firing a bunch of people. Which, which would you prefer? <laughs> so they chose for the software. Um, Green. But that maybe makes sense. Um, and at an organizational level, uh, the Ministry of Finland, I don't think it's, it's a very interesting, for me, very important case, but I think they've rolled back. Uh, they actually came back on their decision, but a bunch of years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, they did a comparative study between OpenOffice, Microsoft Office, and uh, IBM Notes Office, or IBM Office. Uh, they ran the cost comparison. They concluded that IBM would be the cheapest. They chose for OpenOffice, rolled it out. And why, wh why did they do that? And why is this an interesting case? Because they realized the free software license gives you scalability, and, f and it gives you freedom to experiment. They, they already were able to implement it in a pilot program, and it ran so well, and it implemented so easily, and it was maintainable so easily, that before they kind of made the decision process run through the process, they had already installed it in the whole uh, ministry. And that was something that they had never experienced before, and they liked it so much that that's why they, even though it was maybe a bit more expensive than IBM, they, they went for it. The CIO of the ministry did its PhD thesis on this, and anyway, I'll come back on that, because he uh, made a few recommendations that are in here. The second big thing that we need to do is, this is strange, because you know I go from CIO all of a sudden to a tool, but there is no real order in the sequence. We have to make Mozilla Firefox the default browser. It's a complete open source browser. It, um, you, a lot of governments are locked in, uh, or maybe I should say were locked in, in Internet Explorer. Uh, they might be moving away. A lot of them are actually using both Firefox and Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer is maybe on its way out, but it's still very dominant in public administrations. And it's not only a way for a proprietary browser vendor, an operating system vendor, and uh, office solution vendor to lock in a public administration, but you have a lot of service providers that say, our solution requires IE. And it, therefore, they piggyback on the lock-in. 
and they can keep milking the public administration if they, if they believe that they, they need to require IE. So we need to force public administrations to say Firefox is the browser, everything that has to work through the web has to work through Firefox. Mozilla is also very active on the open standards uh, front and this will be a way to reward that. Um, as I mentioned, it breaks the lock into IE, uh, it breaks the lock into a lot of proprietary uh, technology. Uh, an anecdote would be uh, a small Dutch town that decided that this is what they would do, and they started negotiating with all of their vendors saying, okay, we have this web-based tool, we have that web-based tool. If you do not support Firefox, we will move to a different vendor. And all of the vendors started tooling around their software so they would speak the same things in uh, Firefox. It's available in all operating systems, so then you have the freedom to say, you want to use a Mac? Go ahead, use a Mac. You want to use a Linux workstation? Go ahead, use a Linux host. Um, and that's what we need to do. There's like, tons of examples. I'm sorry, my notes are not here, so I'm going to miss a few things, so I remember them quite well. The Supre Supreme Court of Slovenia is a very interesting example. It's, this is the main court of a country. They have people in place that understand very well how this thing works, how lock-in works, how competition works, and how the legal system works. And so they rolled out, they have uh, complete open source workstations, a lot of them. The country, however, th this project is in trouble because the minister that is doing public administration is in the US every like month, every other, other week, and he speaks to all the big vendors, and then they give him a reward, and they give him a you know, a medal, and then they, and he comes back and he says, oh, Cisco this, or uh, HP that, and it makes problems for public administrations that, uh, that try to do the right thing. The ministry also realizes that he is a small country, and like one of these big American firms makes more money than the entire country. They can buy Slovenia. <laughs> um, main the biggest European, one of the biggest European examples is the French Gendarmerie. I will not talk about it long because I'll come back on it later. Interesting is, um, uh, let's see, which one here, interesting. Aarhus in Denmark. Aarhus is the second largest town of Denmark. And they are one of the main drivers behind the OS2 that I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, and so their policy for Firefox is interesting. Arnhem is interesting because it had a huge fine. They had a pilot project that was going to, to figure out an open source uh, uh, switch. Microsoft heard about this, installed a network sniffer, a licensed network sniffer in the network, and uh, the fine was in the millions, um, and it, it robbed the city of its, of its financial power to do the uh, pilot, so that died. The, what is interesting in Arnhem is that the councillor has a PhD in computer science and his whole house runs on Debian, so I hope that he will continue to try this. The Basque country I already mentioned, Munich is already famous. And so in line with making Mozilla the default browser, this is why. Open standards have to become mandatory. And this is very tricky because, you know, now we have a debate about what is, open, what is an open standard and what's the definition. So uh, I don't think I will do that here, but we need to be mindful of that definition. Um, what can I say? What, what I would find practical is that <coughs> we should say that a standard that is open, it needs, to be, it needs to be implementable in open source software. That would make it open. We could require that an open standard can only be put on an open standards list by any government by saying it needs to be implemented, actively implemented, in an open source tool. That would, that would bring a threshold that some of the faux open standards that are currently out there wouldn't be able to jump. OXML is the best example, I think. It's a standard that we should not have allowed in ISO. It should be taken out of ISO, that's my personal opinion. Um, but it's public administrations that use uh, fake open standards are making it really difficult for those that try to use open standards. That's what we see in OSR time and time again. European Commission is one of its, its here is, is a problem by itself because it publishes a lot of documents 
and they don't really understand at the right level the importance of this document format. We keep telling them, and eventually we'll get through to the right persons, but they keep publishing it in this non-open standard that is called an open standard, which is not an open standard, and it's making it really painful for all those that are trying to use ODF. So you need to take care of the selection process if you want to know all the details. Please look at Sweden. They have figured this out. They have First, they took the Dutch list, and the Dutch already made a, a nice selection. Uh, then the Swede says, okay, so we have the Dutch list. We need to make sure that these are really open. And so they had two scientists, Björn Landell and his colleague, think about, so how, what, what does that mean? And it means that you need a community, and it needs to be an open process, and it needs to be low threshold, and everybody should be able to pitch in. And now let's look at this Dutch list and see which of those actually have a community, which are actually made without financial thresholds. And then they weed it down a little list, so it became a little bit smaller. That is a good list to start with. Anyway, and you need to walk your talk. I already mentioned the commission. It says it wants to do open standards. It believes strongly that open standards will fix the lock-in. And now we need to get the commission to commit to its own statements and actually walk its talk. Examples. I, a great example is the UK. They have a fantastically well thought through open standards policy, which is really driving change in, in Great Britain. Um, it, we, it's hard to say that the effects are already visible, but they will become very visible very soon. You, um, I keep asking the GDS to send me uh, concrete examples, and, and that's slow, but it will come. France, uh, already mentioned a few slides ago, also have a very well thought through openness policy, open source, sorry, open standards is a big part of that. They have... Um, recently published uh, the RGI, which is their list of open standards, which in, in the first version, the first draft version, had only ODF and not uh, OXML. It, there was a bit of pressure, not from the proprietary vendor itself, but from the public administration that are using this fake open standard. Um, and so they put it back on in the published version, but they said, warning, this standard has a lot of proprietary links, it's very unclear, it's very difficult. We should, you can only use it for Excel, and you can only use it if there is no way you can, ex you can escape in, your, in whatever you did in your Excel sheet that you cannot use ODF. Otherwise, you should use ODF. Um, the Netherlands, I already touched on it, they have a good list, they have a standardization forum, a standardization board that is also trying to drive change. The Dutch IT policy, when you talk about this topic, free and open source, they say, look, open standards are the thing. That is what we're going to implement all over our, our public administration. And then the change should come by itself to open source, because it's just the best way to implement open source, open standards. Uh, Sweden, I mentioned the list. And the European Commission, if you want to study this more in detail, they have the sharing and reuse framework, which is where OZOR fits in, um, and where open standards are defined, or we're trying to define open standards. We have the EIF, where there is an interesting debate about how to define this thing. That's where it takes place. And we have the CAMS, which is a monitoring process that will show you which countries have which standards. And so there you can just pick out, for example, you will see um, the ODF is basically in almost all the member states, and DOCX or OXML is in a few, like five or six. It's interesting. The fourth main thing we need to do, we as uh, groups that are interested in this process, or they as public administrations, is help the organization change. It's like this. You have a proprietary workstation. In come the open source people, they take away your proprietary workstation, put in place an Ubuntu workstation with LibreOffice, and there you go. For a public administrator, they don't understand what we're doing, because they say, you replaced the stack with something that was exactly the same. Why did you do that? And, and then you have all the other problems that the button isn't, isn't there, and I, the printer won't work, and the telephone is not connected, and my calendar doesn't sync. You have all the little technical things. But they don't get why we're replacing one stack for another. We need to communicate. The best way to drive this change is to do really small-scale pilots and convince the key people in those organizations um, 
why this change is important so that they can talk to their colleagues when their colleagues are like, ah, it's not working. They can say, look, it is working. You just have to you know, click the other icon or fix it for them. Um, and communication is the key aspect. <laughs> you need to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. The Norwegian PhD thesis on the Ministry of Justice, that was his main conclusion. You need in every organization what he called a innovation champion, somebody who can talk and convince and fix and do. And he will go to your desktop and he will fix it on the spot and he will go to the other desktop and explain it to you 10 times if necessary and he will convince everybody in the organization why this is a good thing. Communication is key. Tons of examples, both on the good side and the bad side. Good, I, for me, at this moment, the greatest example is Nantes. Um, Eric Fischer is uh, the IT manager that has set up the change in Nantes. He is the change manager and he has been publishing a lot and he's been talking on conferences such as this one about how to do this change. Uh, Justice Ministry, I just uh, ran ahead of myself, clearly. Um, what is an interesting example, it's a good thing here that my notes aren't clear, that their notes aren't visible and I have to do it from memory. Uh, the city of Munich, they also understood the importance of change uh, and they did the entire desktop as we all know. They had a whole bunch of things. They did newsletters, leaflets, brochures, workshops, conferences for their staff to convince them and explain them. They did awards for, you know, make the best picture of Munich and the best three pictures will be the desktop, def the default desktop images that you can choose from when you start your Linux workstation. And it was, uh, this sounds uh, cool to get people involved in making pictures of Munich, but it was also a way for the IT department to control the desktop pictures. And there are plenty of reasons that you want to control your desktop pictures. To make sure it's professional, because not all the staff will choose a professional picture. Um, the defense ministry in, uh, in Italy, it's currently the largest European, maybe globally the largest rollout of LibreOffice on the desktop. Uh, they use the document foundation uh, change management manual, and it, that's a, a pretty, it's, it's at the bottom, it's a pretty good document. People should use, organizations should use this as a template to consider, okay, this might not entirely fit my organization, but these are the things I need to do. On the bad side, uh, the city of Ede, they had, it's a Dutch town, um, they had it rolled out, they were going to do the whole stack, they had everything uh, on open standards, they had somebody convert all their proprietary document formats to ODF, <coughs> and now they're rolling it all back. Um, what's the reason? The IT, ch the IT manager changed. Uh, in came a new IT manager who had a whole bunch of things that he needed to do and then he had all these resistance in the desktops because people were angry because I just explained you have the desktop, you change everything, nothing works. People were frustrated. He blames, of course, the open source tools. He doesn't blame the change process. And the easiest way to get around this is but which is roll off everything back and he calls his friends and that's just the usual way to do these things. Um, I try to get in touch with these people to figure out what is wrong and then you, you, you just call somebody in the, in the city hall and before you even start talking they become frustrated. Yeah, and they, these IT people, they just change their software and they don't realize that things don't work, we have to do real work here. It's that kind of emotion that the CIO is not going to deal with if the easiest thing to do is, oh, you want the other tool? Fine, you get the other tool. Um, Fiborg, Famous example because they tried LibreOffice um, and then eventually rolled back to Microsoft Office. But there's one thing in Freiburg that's interesting, is that they all used Munich's template and document and procurement process manager called Wolmux. This is a tool that helps you generate your forms. It has the stamps, it has the seals, the signature, the whole thing. And if you do a procurement proposal, um, it fills in all the details that you need to uh, normally take into account and it did it so well that it saved you a whole bunch of time. So when they went back to Microsoft they said, but can we keys please keep Wormux? That unfortunately only works on LibreOffice. So, okay, pain point. Maybe they'll go back eventually. Um, well, the other ones, uh, the Italian towns, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Pesaro, that's the first one, Emilia Romana region and South Tyrol province, they all stopped their open office pilots. I think it's key that it's open office, not LibreOffice. 
uh, there's a lot of rumors. You want to talk to the Italian people to hear the details, but you can say it's corruption. You can say it was false information. You can say it's a bunch of IT people that thought of their career long term because having LibreOffice on your resume might not get you in a job in the next career path that you're choosing. It, 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 there's all kinds of things that go on there. The one thing that happens with all these towns is that they will start to break procurement law again. Because soon they will have to buy licenses and they will ask for Microsoft licenses. The European procurement laws do not allow you to procure brands or products. That said, you can procure Linux because it's a brand, but there are tons of people that can send it to you, and therefore that doesn't inhibit competition. It's a major uh, thing to note. And you need to engage the communities. That's the fifth point. I think it's also the last point. Um, now, how do you do that? This is a headache for all the public administrations. Here are a few ways to fix it. Uh, you make sure you require open source skills. The European Commission, like one or two months ago, did a, a call for IT staff. And they really asked through OZOR and through whatever. They required that people have experience in open source. The change will come from within. If there's more people that understand open source, that work for the commission, it will become easier to install open source tools. Because these guys will say, oh yeah, but we use this in Debian, or we use that in Fedora, or Red Hat does it like this. And before you know it, it will be all over. So when you do your procurement, you can also optimize it for small and medium-sized companies. And do not require that the company has uh, 50 million turnover the past five years, because there's maybe only two companies that do this. Um, you can look at Sweden, again, a good example for the way for learning how to organize this. They do frameworks, that so they negotiate with everybody and they negotiate on behalf of all the public administrations. And the Swedish, Swedish framework for open source has basically all the main big, not big, sm small and medium-sized companies that do open source services are in there. They're like tested and they were approved and so uh, a municipality doesn't have to go through this whole selection process itself it can just use the framework and say uh, I want this Drupal or I want this Red Hat or I want this Fedora or whatever brand of open source uh, product and they will get the serv they can then just say give me the the, the five ser uh, service suppliers can send an offer but they even have the independent entrepreneurs in there so single person companies can in that way get jobs at public administrations, helping them roll out open source. And you need to promote uh, and facilitate open source development. Uh, and there are a, a, a whole bunch of ways to do that. Uh, shall go to the next slide and give you a few examples. Um, the city of Nantes, I already introduced them. It's one of the biggest cities in France. I think it's the eighth or the sixth. They... Um, First, they realized by moving to LibreOffice, we're saving an X amount. I think it was a million for 10,000 desktops or something like that. Doesn't really matter. Uh, that's money that disappears from the IT budget. But that's like not a good thing for the IT department. So they said, let's give them 30% and they can keep that for the next year and the next year. So they can do other things with the savings. Otherwise, it's like, thank you for the savings. And that's not an incentive for the IT department. Um, and so that's one thing. They can do other interesting projects. But they also said, now we have uh, LibreOffice. And there's a few things that don't work the right way in LibreOffice. I'll give you a famous example, an important example. Suppose you have a legal document that does your, um, that fixes the houses and the land around your house that you want to buy or sell. Or if you're a farmer and you have, there's a whole bunch of requirements. And it's a bullet list. And then you send it to the next level, the province, and for them, all of a sudden, it's changed into a numbered list. It will lose the legitimacy. It will lose the value. This is a problem, a document interoperability problem, that really makes it difficult for public administrations to use the mix of OXML and ODT. This is like what the big headache. And now said, OK, so let's do a procurement proposal where we will fix this and a few other problems that we have. Uh, and we will return the uh, fixed product to the upstream of LibreOffice. So they're working, I think the procurement has, was launched last year. It's, it went to a consortium, two companies, including Collabora, uh, one of the LibreOffice developers. And so they are fixing this upstream. And this is a fantastic example of how public administrations realize that their use of our tax money 
actually benefits not only them, but it benefits every other public administration and every other citizen across the world, if we want to go further than the European Union, in that fixes that they, that Nantes has fixed, are now fixed for people in Denmark too. Um, Munich is, uh, I think, in Europe, the biggest public administration that contributes to main open source projects. Uh, if you look at all the code, then the Commission will win, but that's maybe a different battle. But at the city level, Munich is by far the biggest. They contribute, well, sorry, the notes are not there. I have to do this by memory. You have to forgive me if I have it wrong, but there's, there's, they have uh, 500 patches or 400 patches into LibreOffice. They use, I think, LibreOffice 4, and their patches are in upstream in 5, um, but they have a few issues why they can't upgrade itself, so they have fixed LibreOffice 4. Those code improvements are available to all of us in 5. They have Volmex, the template manager that I mentioned. They have a, uh, an implementation uh, manager. They have uh, tools to manage the rollout, upgrade, and uh, implementation of workstations. There's, there's a whole bunch. Uh, DINSIC, the French uh, government modernization unit, uh, one of the ways in which they organize this is in hackathons. Um, I can say a few nice things about those things. It, it was, France has, they open source the tax code. Um, they also open source the code that selects uh, which student goes to which universities. And in both cases, it was a sort of a same drive. Um, th let's do the, f the student example first. So. Uh, this year or last year, the, uh, the student uh, allotment system um, had a few glitches and there were student unions that were trying to figure out why this didn't work the way it should have worked. And they started asking the members in parliament and they started asking the minister and the minister gave answers and then they, they looked at and it doesn't make sense because that's what he says, but that's not what happened. Can you send us how this is done? Send us the source code. And then the minister printed the source code and gave them the source code. And, uh, this is ridiculous. So it's no way we can check this. So then eventually, the whole government realized: okay, so we need to check. We need to you. We need to start considering source code the way we consider data. We need to publish it. We need to make it machine readable and available because we. This is how we do openness. This is how we are being checked by the citizens these days. And it changed the law. So now in France, if you want to know an algorithm that is used in your process, you can go to a court and say, can I have that code, please? It doesn't really make it available as open source, but it's a start. And the other example is the tax code, where one of the guys that worked at DINSIC on a Friday afternoon had, you know, his task ran out. He was an intern. And he said, you know what, I'll just see if I can maybe improve the, the income tax application. And so he started digging. And it's a long story, and he had to go to court like two or three times, and the minister said, no, it is like way too complex because we are, it runs on faxes, and it runs on PDPs, and it runs, it doesn't, you know, we can't give it to you on a floppy. And, and then the, minister, the, the guys that overruled that decision say, yeah, technically difficult, that's not a good answer, so, you know, make it so. Eventually, the text source code also became available as open source. And so they organized hackathons where they, they asked these people, the, the, the use and the me's, to come to the ministry and then look at the code and see if we can do something more interesting with it. And it's a great example. France is leading here. Um, it would be nice if others do the same. Um, main implementations. I will speed up because I think most of these are known for you. And I'm also running out of time. And maybe there should be some time for questions. Um, I've arranged it in three big parts because this is the, des the desktop room. So you have the main complete desktop operating system implementations. Then you'll have the ones that basically do LibreOffice. And then I have an annex, which are all the others, which I would do if you uh, want to sit here for another hour or something. So operating systems and office productivity. The first one. 72,000 workstations across all the gendarmerie in France. Uh, they, it, everywhere here, everybody always says price. It's the first thing they say. But the French also make it very clear that price, yeah, it's nice, interesting. It lowers the total cost of ownership by 40%. But man, does it make it much easier for us to do IT on workstations. This open source stuff, we should have done this years ago. They had a guy. He would fly to Australia and then fly to an island in the Pacific and then had to go to 
an island by canoe and then by ferry and then he had to visit all these islands to update the police posts antivirus definitions <laughs> and then he would come back he would make it to Paris and they would give him a new desk uh, sh set of CD-ROMs and he could go back again. He would be gone all the time. A fantastic job, I would love to have it. But with Ubuntu, which is what they use, they don't need that because it rolls out automatically. Uh, besides this whole virus thing, is uh, much less of a headache. They also, so they, this, they say our e-tail stack is much easier because we can control everything and it is, you know, we, we program it here and it rolls out across the whole gendarmerie, 72,000 desktops yeah, well almost, it says here that I have 41 minutes um, and so, and they say it's priceless to be, uh, uh, to get rid of your lock-in the second one is City of Munich, that's 18,000 desktops also, um, uh, Linux and LibreOffice. The city of Saragossa, which is 1200. It's a fragile process. These are a few, uh, like a handful of people that are doing this, and they're under an enormous amount of time pressure uh, using all their free time to do this. Um, a quick list of the ones that are doing LibreOffice or OpenOffice, but it's mostly LibreOffice. So, first, the ministries in France, there's 500,000 of them, it's half a million. And they really use it. I've checked this a few times over the past few weeks. They re it's their first, it's the only operating system, only uh, office uh, suite on those desktops. It's 17 of the 33 ministries. Um, and in the Dutch central government, that's all about 100,000. That number is not entirely, sh they, they couldn't really know, they couldn't really tell me how much they have. But this is the total number of central government civil servants, and they all have access to it. Ministry of Defense in Italy, uh, that's going to be 100,000 workstations with LibreOffice. It will make it the biggest one. Extremadura. This project, I put it here because it's famous, but it's broken. These numbers are no longer valid, and they're rolling it all back to, Libre, to Microsoft. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, um, but that's basically a dead project. Toulouse, uh, 10,000 workstations. Basque Country, 8,000 workstations. The police in Lithuania, 8,000 workstations. Nantes, 5,000. So this is the... I'll skip the annex. The key policies that you need to look at if you're interested. Uh, I already introduced France, so that's the one. The other one is United, King United Kingdoms, their open source, uh, sorry, open standards policy. And Bulgaria, also famous, because they uh, managed to get into law that all code developed for and by a public administration from day one must be done on a repository which will be mirrored to GitHub. This is the way to do it for a, for a public administration. You host it on your own repository and you link it to GitHub. Keep it under control. The expected benefits. How much time do I still have? Uh, you are on minus three minutes. <laughs> yeah. 40 yeah. minutes, not 45. It's 40 minutes, I'm sorry. Expe I'll just... <coughs> This is one more slide, the expected benefits, it's clear for all of us here. Autonomy, sovereignty and control, um, the efficiency and the growth, that's an important one. The growth of local enterprises, it really happens in France and in the Basque country, you can see this. So what's missing, this is the last slide. We need more politicians that know how this works, we need more politicians that realize these are the, ex the benefits and these are the disadvantages of proprietary. Uh, and we need well-organized advocacy. So this is slowly happening, but it's not there yet. And we need patches for procurement, because procurement in Europe is really broken, and it's in favor of proprietary, and that needs to be fixed ASAP. And that's it. Thank you very much.